In 2021, 28-year-old Jessica Nicole Stacks, a mother of three, was living in New Albany, Mississippi, and was in a relationship with 45-year-old Jerry Wayne Baggett. Unfortunately, their relationship was very tumultuous, and he was allegedly physically abusive toward her. On New Year's Day, 2021, Jessica and Jerry borrowed a boat from a friend with no oars or a motor to float down the Little Tallahatchie River in order to search for wild hogs that were stranded due to the swollen river. At 5.30 a.m. that morning, surveillance video at Poolville Quick Stop on Highway 30 shows them stopping for gas. After leaving there, they launched the boat near a bridge on County Road 46 in Union County, Mississippi. Jerry alleges that two miles down the river, the boat began taking on water, so they pulled onto a nearby sandbar to empty it out. It was there that he claimed they had gotten into an argument and Jessica got out of the boat and began walking. He continued on in the boat and claimed the last time he saw her, she was walking down the sandbar toward Highway 30. He said he eventually went back, but she was nowhere to be found. 12 hours later, at 10.15 p.m., he reported Jessica missing. Before they searched for her, Jerry told them that Jessica had cut off the top of her boot because it was rubbing her leg. When law enforcement arrived and began searching the woods near the river, they found her coat, a pair of gloves, footprints, a single woman-size six or seven, and a green rubber boot with the top cut off, just as Jerry said. They followed the footprints about 100 yards west up the river bank towards County Road 46. The tracks then turned north towards Highway 30 and disappeared into a flooded field. Her family doesn't believe Jerry's story, especially the part about them taking the boat without oars or a motor. They also feel like investigators took Jerry at his word and didn't handle the investigation properly. Her mother, Kathy Payton, said Jessica enjoyed fishing, but doesn't believe she would have ever gone hog hunting. Interestingly, Jessica's purse was still in the boat. Kathy believes her daughter would have taken this with her if she had planned to walk back to the highway. As for Jessica's phone, Jerry claims she left it with a friend so they could call and tell him where to pick them up. Wouldn't the friends have had cell phones of their own? Kathy even tried to reach out to Jessica at 10 a.m. the day she went missing, but strangely, an unknown man answered. She told the man to have Jessica call her, but he said he didn't know where she was and hung up. Jerry's daughter called her a few moments later and told her not to worry about Jessica. However, by that evening, when there was still no word from her, she began to worry something bad had happened. Around August of 2021, investigators worked with the Army Corps of Engineers to have them temporarily hold the water back that drains into Sardis Lake. They then brought in an excavator to dig up areas along the river, but still nothing was found. In February of 2023, News Nation interviewed Jerry, and he strangely changed his story and said he never saw Jessica on January 1st and claimed he was working that day. He also claimed he hadn't seen her for a few days before she went missing and that the story of the friend's boat was false. His explanation for why they didn't take the boat? According to him, neither of them could swim. It's of note that Jerry took a polygraph exam, but the results have not been released to the public. A woman named Barbie Floyd came forward and claimed to have first-hand knowledge of what happened to Jessica. She says that on December 31st, 2020, the day before Jessica went missing, Jessica, Jerry, and Jerry's friend, Billy Jack Rogers, went to her house to do drugs. She said they left in the early morning hours of January 1st, but Billy Jack and Jerry came running back to the house, and she heard him say, and I quote, that didn't mean you had to kill her, unquote. Barbie said that after they left again, her father's shovels were missing and there was blood on the porch. She said after the incident, she tried to tell law enforcement, but because of her drug habits, they didn't believe her. She claims that the events of that night caused her to enter rehab and she has been sober ever since. Investigators eventually presented all their evidence to the district attorney, but he didn't feel like they had enough yet to present the case to a grand jury. While little evidence was found to back up Jerry's original story, besides footprints, which could have been made by anyone, there is also no evidence of foul play besides Barbie's story. Sadly, as of 2024, Jessica has not been found, and this case remains unsolved.
Kimberly Jo Holcomb Watts was born on December 22, 1965, and raised in Gulfport, Mississippi. After Kim graduated from Gulfport High School, she went on to receive her Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from the University of Southern Mississippi. Family and friends described her as a fun person who was full of life. They also said she loved to cook and shop and spend time with friends, but most of all, they said she loved being a mother. After college, she met Thomas Dale Watts, who went by Tom, while he was in rehab for prescription drug abuse, and in April 1996, they married. They had a son named Trevor, but the marriage wouldn't last. In 2007, Kim filed for divorce, which wasn't finalized for another two years due to Tom fighting the judge's custody ruling. During this time, Trevor wanted to live with his dad full time, but the judge found that Tom had allegedly manipulated Trevor and turned him against his mother. Once the divorce was final and Kim had custody, Trevor began to slowly realize that his mother wasn't the bad guy that his father made her out to be. By 2014, Kim was living in Long Beach, Mississippi with Trevor and working as a nurse at Gulfport Memorial Hospital. On November 11, 2014, when Kim failed to show up for work, her sister, Sherry Bass, who also worked at the hospital, was immediately concerned. So she called her husband, George, and asked him to go by and check on her. When he arrived minutes later, he knocked on the door and yelled for Kim, but received no response. So he went inside and sadly found Kim's body on the floor in her bedroom with her purse still on her shoulder. An autopsy determined that she had been stabbed and strangled to death. Investigators at the scene didn't find any signs of forced entry, but did find a bag with bleach and wipes inside by the back door. They discovered that the killer had thrown the breakers in the home, preventing her garage from opening and forcing her to park outside and enter through the front door. Apparently, if she had entered through the garage, it would have been near impossible for her killer to have caught her off guard. However, this left investigators wondering how the intruder got into the house since there was no signs of forced entry and only Kim and her family had keys. Interestingly, Trevor seemed to know the answer. He said that his father knew how to pick locks and even showed him how to pick deadbolts, which, according to Trevor, can be very difficult. Sadly, on the day of the murder, 18-year-old Trevor, who was in his first semester at Ole Miss in Oxford, Mississippi, learned of his mother's murder from his ex-girlfriend. At the same time, a family member was on their way to Oxford to break the news and bring him home. He spent his first night back with his father and noticed fresh scratches on the back of his hand that looked to him like deep scratches caused by someone's fingernails. This made him immediately suspicious of his father. However, things that night would get even stranger. In the middle of the night, while Trevor was sound asleep, he suddenly woke up to find his father standing by his bed, staring down at him. Trevor would later say that it wasn't the first time his father had done that. However, after that night, Trevor never slept at his father's home again. The next time they met was at a church in Long Beach, where Trevor asked him if he murdered his mother, but Tom refused to answer and just stared at Trevor. He also said his father wasn't upset at all about his ex-wife's death. He continued asking his father questions, such as, what were you doing during this time? But Tom never gave a yes or no answer and basically hemmed hauled around. At that point, Trevor was convinced his father murdered his mother, but with no solid physical evidence, police were unable to arrest him. When Tom was brought in for questioning, he refused to answer any questions. Trevor then filed a wrongful death suit against his father. During the pre-trial testimony, Tom once again refused to answer any questions and invoked his Fifth Amendment right. In 2019, the suit was dismissed, citing lack of evidence. However, the suit did reveal more details about Kim and Tom's marriage. Allegedly, he was very abusive and had gone to drug rehab twice during the marriage. Trevor had even witnessed his father grab his mother's hair and her head before finally punching a hole in the wall. After the marriage, he tried to get full custody of Trevor but lost, and the judge ordered him to pay monthly child support and alimony as well as Kim's $15,000 attorney fees. All this did was anger Tom even more than he already was. 
This might explain why Kim told her sister, Sherry, that she feared Tom would try and kill her one day. Her brother-in-law, George Bass, who found her on November 11th, went on to become the mayor of Long Beach. Unfortunately, this caused Kim's case to get reassigned to the Harrison County Sheriff's Department to prevent any conflicts of interest. Unfortunately, as of 2024, no one has been arrested for her murder, and this case remains unsolved. Madeline Pons was born to Wesley and Mary Ann on March 11, 1969, and went by the nickname Midge. In 1986, 17-year-old Midge was a senior in high school with plans to join the armed forces. She was living with her parents in Ethelsville, Alabama, but working across the state line in Columbus, Mississippi at PJ's One Stop on Highway 82. On November 20, 1986, Midge was working alone at the gas station when her mother stopped by around 8.30 p.m. to drop off some dinner. After chatting for a few minutes, she left and returned home, which was only a few minutes away. Less than five minutes after she left, a customer came by the store, found it unattended, and called the police. When authorities arrived, they found Midge's belongings and her car in the parking lot with her purse, wallet, keys, and hairbrush still inside. However, there was no sign of Midge, and she has never been seen again. Investigators believe she was abducted when someone came in to rob the place, as $600 was missing from the register. A massive search took place between Columbus and Ethelsville, but no signs of Madeline were found. In 1991, a person called the police to report that Midge was living in Anniston, Alabama and working at a poultry plant. When detectives arrived to investigate the tip, they glanced at the woman and thought they had found Midge. They were so convinced, they brought in Midge's uncle, but he said it wasn't her, even though he agreed the resemblance was uncanny. Between late 2010 and early 2011, the sheriff's department checked a well that sat behind the store but had since been covered with a barbecue pit and was now inside an addition to the building, but no signs of Madeline were found. Sadly, both her parents have since passed away, Marianne in 2016 and Wesley in 2020. As of 2024, Midge has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Mary Jacqueline Levitz was born on February 11, 1933, and went by her middle name. Over the years, Jacqueline would marry three different times, with her final marriage being to Ralph Levitz, who co-founded Levitz Furniture in 1963 with his brother Leon. By 1985, the company was a billion-dollar empire with 135 stores in 26 states. However, by 1997, the company was having financial problems and declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy. In 2005, they declared bankruptcy again, and by 2008, the entire company had closed. However, Ralph nor Jacqueline would live long enough to see the company's downfall. Ralph and Jacqueline had met at a Palm Beach party, and he hired her to decorate his Palm Beach mansion. After they were married, she began to spend money trying to enter the Palm Beach Society. Unfortunately, two months after their marriage, Ralph suffered a stroke on a Palm Beach golf course. He lived for eight more years before dying in March of 1995. His entire estate, worth an estimated $15 million, was left to Jacqueline. A sister-in-law of Jacqueline said that during those eight years, she took really good care of Ralph, making sure his life was wonderful. However, others said she wasn't all peaches and sunshine. It was said that in October of 1991, she fired everybody connected to Ralph, which gave her full control of all his accounts. Those firings included the CPA firm, the housekeepers, and his valet. After his death in October of 1995, she moved from Palm Beach, Florida to Vicksburg, Mississippi to be closer to family. Her home in Vicksburg was being extensively remodeled, but she continued living in there, even though there was only a mattress, some plastic garden chairs, and a refrigerator inside. On November 18, 1995, Jacqueline went to a local business in Vicksburg and bought some wallpaper for the house. 
After leaving the store, she was never seen again. Two days later, on November 20th, her brother-in-law, James Earl Shivers, went to her house to see why she hadn't been answering her phone for the last two days. Once there, he found her cream-colored Jaguar parked out front with the door unlocked. Thinking maybe she was inside the home, he entered only to find a horrifying scene that looked to him like a violent struggle had occurred. After seeing that, he called the police. Investigators searched the home and found torn fingernails on the floor, as well as blood on her mattress and the bedroom carpet. Strangely, the mattress was turned over, possibly in an attempt to conceal the blood. It's theorized that someone followed her home and then murdered her, and the motive was robbery because of her missing bags. One bag was a small purse where she kept her wallet, and the other was a larger makeup bag in which she kept hairspray and some other items in. However, the suspect or suspects strangely left behind expensive fur coats, a pair of diamond earrings worth $3,000, and jewelry from the safe worth over $500,000. There was also a glass of water beside the earring on the windowsill, which her family said she would have never done. Unfortunately, there was still no sign of Mary. There's some speculation that she could be linked to the murder of Irene Silverman, who vanished from her home in Manhattan, New York, in 1998. In May 2000, Sante Kimes and her son, Kenneth Kimes Jr., were charged with Irene's murder, but they never told what they did with her body. While the Kimes are considered persons of interest in Jacqueline's disappearance, they've never been charged. They'll most likely never find Jacqueline's remains because investigators believe she was tossed in the Mississippi River that runs close to her house, and on November 18, 2000, she was declared legally dead. It's now been over 25 years since Jacqueline disappeared, and as of 2024, this case remains unsolved. Timothy Waldrop was born on November 14, 1957. On the morning of February 1, 1992, 24-year-old Timothy left the home that he shared with his girlfriend in Gulfport, Mississippi, in his yellow 1973 Dodge Dart with his dog, a black child named Bear. He then went to the Sand Hill Apartments where his mother and brother lived. After leaving there, he was never seen again. The following day, on February 2nd, his car was found abandoned in a parking lot across the street from a gas station on Cedar Lake Road by Interstate 10 in Biloxi, Mississippi. This location is about 15 miles away from his home. Four days later, Bear was found on Old Highway 49 in Socher, Mississippi, and had allegedly been in the area since the day Timothy went missing. Unfortunately, there is very little information in this case, and as of 2024, he has never been found, and his disappearance remains unsolved. 